Hello, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Namrutha Mazumdar, the Lead for Policy Outreach for the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds Program, or abbreviated as SLFRF, as you'll hear um, throughout this presentation. We're in the Office of Recovery Programs at the US Department of the Treasury. Today's session is intended to provide an overview of the compliance and reporting guidance last updated by Treasury on February 28th, 2022 that your jurisdiction as a non-entitlement unit of local government or NEU will need to comply and follow as you submit your records to Treasury. But first, let me thank you all on behalf of the Office of Recovery Programs for all you are doing to support your communities in the recovery from the coronavirus pandemic. Your governments and workers have been on the front lines for two years and the whole team at Treasury is dedicated to supporting you in these efforts. The American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, um, otherwise known as ARPA, provided much necessary funds to support the critical needs of communities across the country. The American people also expect all of us to ensure they are used wisely and take every effort to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. One of the responsibilities that you, as an SLFRF recipient, is to report on the use of funds. While accounting for and reporting on the use of funds creates additional work to administer these funds, this reporting is a bedrock of our efforts to ensure expenditures are in compliance with eligible uses. The SLFRF program um, requires program financial and performance reporting to build public awareness, increase accountability, and monitor compliance of eligible uses. Next slide, please. During today's session, members of the Treasury's Office of Recovery Programs will be providing an overview of the SLFRF Compliance and Reporting Guidance, or Reporting Guidance for Simplicity. The updated reporting guidance builds on the final rule which will be effective on April 1st, 2022. There will be an overview followed by a short review of the general guidance. This session will then focus on covering each section of the reporting guidance with some time at the end for questions. We have designed this webinar to provide an overview of key elements of the program to help you navigate the guidance and make plans to put these one-time and unprecedented flexible funds to use for transformative investments in your communities. This webinar will last one hour, starting with presentation followed by Q&A. Participants are in listen-only mode, but as I mentioned, there will be a dedicated Q&A session at the end. Questions can be submitted through the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. You will not see questions submitted by other participants, but we will be collecting them throughout the session and addressing as many as we can in the Q&A portion of the agenda. Next slide, please. Finally, before we get started, I want to share information about resources that will help you navigate the state and local fiscal recovery funds program. If you have questions on allowable uses, your best source is the overview of the final rule, which is a concise summary of the final rule. If you want to learn more about eligible uses listed in the overview of the final rule, you should read the final rule itself. And if you have questions about the eligible uses, you should consult the related FAQs. All of these can be found on www.treasury.gov slash SLFRP, which is our treasury website for this program. You can find information about the program on our website, including the page specifically dedicated to NEUs, which um, we are dropping in the chat. The overview document, final rule, and FAQs are located on our general website. To access the reporting guidance, um, you should click on the reporting and guidance um, part of the website, and a short link for that is www.treasury.gov slash SLFRP reporting. If you have questions on eligible uses or other topics we will not be covering today, you can email us as slfrp at treasury.gov. If these resources don't address your specific questions, please be sure to email us um, at that email. Next slide, please. Now I'd like to introduce Kitty Richards. 
Kitty is a director of the State and Local Fiscal Recovery Funds Program, and we'll be giving you a brief overview of the program. Kitty, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much, Namritha. I appreciate it. And um, thank you to all of you for joining the webinar today. So I'd like to start with just a quick reminder of where we were just 14 months ago when President Biden took office. The country was in its worst wave of COVID deaths. Vaccines had yet to become widely available and more Americans were applying for unemployment insurance each week than during the worst week of the Great Recession. For cities on the front lines of responding to the pandemic, the outlook was dire. The National League of Cities reported in December 2020 that 90% of cities were experiencing revenue declines and 76% were shouldering increases in costs due to the pandemic. Another survey of local officials found that 70% of cities anticipated making dramatic service cuts. For many cities, including non-entitlement units of local government, NEUs, who did not receive direct allocations of funds through prior relief packages, the outlook was particularly troubling. The American Rescue Plan included $350 billion in fiscal support for tens of thousands of state, local, territorial, and tribal governments to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. Of that amount, almost $20 billion was designated to support tens of thousands of NEUs, which are local governments typically serving a population under 50,000. Treasury launched, launched the SLFRF program on May 10th, 2021, when the interim final rule was released and Treasury opened the payment portal so that state, local, and tribal governments could start receiving their funding. As an NEU, you received your payments directly from your state or territory government. The goal of our program is to provide governments with the resources they need to achieve three crucial purposes. First, it provides them with the resources to fight the pandemic and support families and businesses struggling with its public health and economic impacts. Second, it allows them to maintain vital public services amid declines in revenue resulting from the crisis, avoiding some of the devastating cuts that we experienced coming out of the last recession. And third, it gives them the tools to support a strong, resilient, and equitable recovery by making investments that support, support long-term growth and opportunity. Before we provide a high-level overview of the final rules provisions, I wanna remind you that the final rule takes effect on April 1st. Treasury would like to reassure any use that funds used consistent with the interim final rule both previously and until the final rule takes effect on April 1st, are in compliance with the program. For any further questions on this topic, please consult the statement regarding compliance with the IFR and the final rule on the Treasury website. We work to structure the rules for the fiscal recovery funds with sufficient flexibility that recipients could respond to varying local needs and to an evolving pandemic and economic recovery that we couldn't fully predict. We were also intentional in structuring the program to work for a wide and diverse range of governments, from the largest state to the smallest locality, including any use that are less familiar with practices around federal funding. This flexibility made sure that governments, especially smaller localities that had not previously received direct federal aid during the pandemic, were able to immediately spend funds to address their most urgent needs. So as a reminder, under the American Rescue Plan Act, state and local fiscal recovery funds can be used in four eligible use categories. First, the most flexible eligible use is funds to replace lost public sector revenues. Funds can support general government services up to the amount of revenue lost due to the pandemic. Second, recipients may use funds to respond to COVID-19's public health and negative economic impacts. Third, Recipients may provide additional support through premium pay to essential workers who bear the greatest health risks because of their service in critical sectors. And fourth, recipients may invest in necessary water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure. Within these four eligible use categories, I'd like to highlight the areas where we improved the flexibility and simplicity of the program in line with feedback from recipients for the final rule. First, Perhaps the biggest step we've taken is allowing any government to choose a $10 million standard allowance for revenue loss, 
which permits them to use these funds for general government services. Examples of these government services range from road construction to public safety to supporting schools. When recipients do elect to claim a flat standard allowance of $10 million in revenue loss, they can forgo completing the full revenue loss calculation and may take the standard allowance even if they did not demonstrate lost revenue. This change will allow NEUs to use their full award for general government services, at least for most NEUs, with streamlined reporting and tracking. NEUs may still spend funds on eligible uses related to public health, economic impacts, or infrastructure, and report the funds as spent under revenue loss with those streamlined reporting requirements. Second, Treasury has broadened the list of eligible uses specifically included in the rule that recipients can use to respond to COVID-19 and its economic impacts, equipping states and localities to adapt quickly and nimbly to changing public health and economic needs, including the Omicron variant. This includes clarifying that recipients may use funds for capital projects that respond to pandemic impacts, for example, to build affordable housing and job training centers, as well as hospitals and schools designed to serve disproportionately impacted communities, as long as the project is consistent with Treasury requirements described in the final rule. Third, Treasury has also streamlined the provision of premium pay by broadening the share of essential workers who can receive premium pay without written justification. And fourth, Treasury has expanded eligible water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure projects, understanding the unique challenges facing each recipient in delivering clean water and high-speed broadband to their communities. I'd like to turn back to the $10 million standard allowance for revenue loss. The revenue loss eligible use category allows governments to use these funds for general government services. This means governments, regardless of their actual loss of revenue or size of allocation, can claim a flat standard allowance, if they choose, of up to $10 million in revenue loss, rather than completing the full revenue loss calculation, and then spend those funds on government services. The eligible use of replacing public sector revenue loss is the most flexible eligible use category, as recipients can generally spend these funds on any service they traditionally provide, up to the amount of their revenue loss, including that $10 million standard allowance. Under the IFR, recipients were required to calculate revenue loss according to a formula, and the final rule instead provides this option for recipients to elect either the flat standard allowance of revenue loss up to $10 million or to calculate revenue loss according to the formula. The standard allowance amount is based on an analysis of average state and local revenues across the country, and it really dramatically simplifies the program and eases administrative burden, particularly for smaller governments that may have limited administrative capacity. Electing the standard allowance does not increase a recipient's total award amount. For example, if a recipient has a total award amount of $9 million, they may spend up to that $9 million on government services if they elect the standard allowance, but their total award size remains the same. Examples of these government services range from road construction to provision of public safety services to schools, with some exceptions that you can find under restrictions on use in the overview document, but those exceptions are very few and they're statutory. While we provided examples of what government services might entail, recipients can still spend their revenue loss on uses that are eligible in other parts of the final rule. But, and in fact, Treasury really encourages you to spend these resources on those core responses to the pandemic, on supporting families and building a more equitable recovery, investing in water, sewer, and broadband, and premium pay. But if you elect the standard allowance, again, you may still report all of those expenditures under government services and take advantage of those streamlined reporting requirements under revenue loss. Further information about the other eligible uses established under the final rule is included in the webinars posted on our website at www.treasury.gov forward slash SLFRP. I want to stress once again that recipients can use their funds under revenue loss to fund anything that would qualify as a government service. The restrictions on revenue loss include general restrictions on use for the program. First, 
the final rule maintains the IFR's prohibition that states and territories may not use funds to directly or indirectly offset a reduction in net tax revenue resulting from a change in state or territory law as required by the statute, with additional technical clarifications. Second, the final rule clarifies the prohibition on extraordinary contributions to pension funds. This prohibition does not apply to tribal governments. Again, it is statutory. Finally, for all recipients, the final rule maintains that funds may not be used for debt service, to replenish reserves or rainy day funds, or to satisfy a settlement or judgment. Further, the final rule clarifies that funds cannot be used to undermine COVID-19 mitigation practices in line with CDC guidelines and recommendations or violate the uniform guidance conflict of interest requirements or other applicable laws. More information is available in the final rule in our overview on the Trevor, uh, Treasury website. On February 28, 2022, Treasury released the updated SLFRF compliance and reporting guidance, which builds on the final rule. This guidance is intended to provide recipients with a full overview of their compliance and reporting responsibilities as recipients. When developing this guidance, we had a number of objectives in mind. Accountability. First, these funds provide critical support to communities across the country. The American people also expect all of us to ensure they are used wisely and take every effort to prevent waste, fraud, and abuse. This guidance reminds recipients of their obligations and provides a full overview of responsibilities under the award terms and conditions, the final rule, and the uniform guidance. One of these responsibilities, which we will focus on today, is reporting on the use of funds. While many NEUs may take advantage of the $10 million standard allowance and the streamlined reporting requirements that come with revenue loss, reporting for this program is the bedrock of our efforts to ensure expenditures are in compliance with eligible uses. Reporting for this program builds public awareness, increases accountability, and monitors compliance. Recipients are required to account for every dollar spent and provide detailed information on how funds are used. Second, transparency. Given the nature and magnitude of this program, there will be significant interest in how these funds are used. Transparency is the bedrock of accountability and will provide important information for your community as well as leaders here in Washington about how state and local fiscal recovery funds are being used to advance an equitable economic recovery. Treasury will provide comprehensive public reporting based on the information you submit to us. And third, user-friendly. We recognize that this reporting, while necessary, places a burden on you and that we have a responsibility to minimize that burden to the extent possible. In addition, this guidance includes a number of provisions designed designed to promote an equitable recovery and effective use of these funds. First, we're equity focused. Treasury is committed to encouraging uses of funds that enhance racial and economic equity in communities across the country. This reporting guidance ensures that recipients will focus on equity in their planning and holds them accountable for tracking what proportion of their funds are going toward projects that will benefit economically distressed communities. Second, the guidance requires that recipients to report on how they are engaging the community to inform how funds are spent. Recipients are also required to describe how funds will build the capacity of community organizations to serve people with significant barriers to services, including people of color, people with low incomes, and other traditionally underserved groups. Third, the American Rescue Plan and Treasury's final rule for the state and local fiscal recovery funds support public sector employees, essential personnel, and other workers who will drive America's recovery from the COVID-19 crisis. This reporting guidance builds on the final rule to ensure transparency and accountability for labor practices under the program. Finally, some recipients are required to track their project outcomes over time, and some recipients are required to provide information about what portion of their funds are spent on evidence-based interventions or are being evaluated. Now I'd like to introduce Chris Sun, the Reporting and Compliance Lead for the Office of Recovery Programs, who will review the annual reporting guidance for NEUs. 
Great, thanks so much, Katie. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Katie mentioned, my name is Chris, and I'm really excited to be able to join you today. Uh, in the following section, I'm gonna cover some high-level parts of our compliance and reporting guidance uh, before moving on more specifically to reporting requirements uh, relevant to you as an NEU. First, let me start with part one of the guidance, which provides an orientation on recipients' compliance responsibilities and Treasury's expectations and recommended best practices. As mentioned, we are all responsible for effective oversight of these funds. As a recipient, you are the first line of defense and responsible for ensuring award funds are not used for ineligible purposes and that there is no fraud, waste, and abuse associated with your award. Part one provides you with a short overview of the four main sources of recipient compliance responsibilities. The statute, Treasury's final rule, the uniform guidance, and the award terms and conditions. I'm not gonna go through each in detail uh, as when it comes to fulfilling these obligations, there's no substitute for consulting the underlying documents uh, and ensuring that you and your staff understand and adhere to these provisions. But I do wanna highlight a few key points quickly. Part 1B provides an overview of the four permitted statutory uses of SLFRF award funds. Part 1C1 provides an overview of eligible and restricted uses, which Kitty reviewed earlier. As a recipient of an SLFRF award, as previously discussed, your organization has substantial discretion to use fun award funds in the ways that best suits the needs of your constituents. As long as such use fits into one of the four eligible use categories, public health, negative economic impacts, lost revenue, and premium pay, and water, sewer, uh, and broadband, broadband infrastructure. Specifically, restricted uses include debt service, deposits into pension funds, and tax reductions. In addition to determining a given project's eligibility, Recipients are also responsible for determining their subrecipients or beneficiaries eligibility and must monitor their use of SLFRF award funds. Second, as discussed in part 1C2 of the guidance, you may use SLFRF funds to cover eligible costs during the period that begins on March 3rd, 2021 and ends on December 31st, 2024 as long as the funds are obligated by December 31st, 2024, and expended by December 31st, 2026. Next slide, please. Now that we've covered the reporting guidance, let's turn to discussing reporting requirements and how to perform your reporting responsibilities in more detail, which is included in part two of the guidance. As mentioned earlier, the Treasury team has worked hard to design reporting requirements which fulfill our oversight and transparency responsibilities while minimizing the burden on recipients like yourself. In this section, I'll talk about the specific reporting requirements applicable to any use and cover some key concepts for completing your reporting. As an NEU, you are first required to submit certain documents to Treasury through Treasury's online reporting portal. They include the uh, signed award terms, signed civil rights compliance form, and associated budget documents. Uh, these documents need to be provided by April 30th, 2022. Again, these three documents are to be uploaded in the portal and are as follows. You know, the, uh, as I mentioned before, the copy of the signed award terms and conditions agreement that you uh, signed and submitted to your state, uh, the signed assurances of compliance with Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which you would have signed and submitted to your state or territory, and a copy of the actual budget documents validating the top line budget total that you provided to your state or territory as part of the request for funding. To report, on uh, to report and uh, submit these documents 
uh, you can log into the Treasury portal now and this report form is available to you. We encourage you to submit these uh, as soon as possible if you haven't already. In order to fulfill your reporting requirements, you are encouraged to access the Treasury reporting portal again as soon as possible to confirm your accounts and make sure that the account information is accurate, uh, to designate the SLFRF reporting roles to yourself and other users from your jurisdiction who may need to assist in reporting, and lastly, to submit the required documents and uh, agreements that we just discussed uh, prior to uh, the project and expansion report, which we'll touch on in a second. A link to the Treasury reporting portal should have been emailed to you uh, from Treasury uh, over the past few months. Further guidance to complete these activities are covered in the NEU user guide posted on the Treasury website at www.treasury.gov forward slash SLFRP reporting. In addition, Treasury has posted a video recording to assist NEUs to log into the Treasury portal and perform these reporting activities. The link is available on your screen and is also available, again, on our website. Separately, as an NEU, you are required to submit an upcoming project and expenditure report. The project and expenditure report provides a detailed breakdown of projects funded, obligations and expenditures, subawards, and some programmatic data associated with your use of SLFRF funds. If you elect to select the standard allowance under revenue loss that Kitty just went over, your reporting requirements will be much more simplified. If you are an NEU uh, allocated more than $10 million in SLFRF funds, you have been deemed a tier two recipient and you will be required to submit a project and expenditure report by April 30th, 2022 and then 30 days after the end of each subsequent quarter thereafter. If you are an NEU that has allocated less than 10 million in SLFRF funds, you are a tier five recipient and you will be asked to submit a report again by April 30th, 2022, and then only annually thereafter. We want to note that consolidated jurisdictions and other types of jurisdictions that receive multiple SLFRF uh, allocations, for example, a city and an NEU uh, with a single government doing reporting, are only required to file uh, one report per reporting period. And such reports will cover the total SLFRF allocations received by your jurisdiction. This includes NEUs and or other units of uh, general local government within counties that are not units of general local government. In addition, the total SLFRF allocations across all sources uh, for a given jurisdiction will be used to identify the jurisdiction's reporting tier. So as an NEU, at a high level, there are two ways available to complete your uh, project and expenditure report. Uh, the first uh, path or option that we're going to talk about uh, is the more streamlined option for your report, your projects under expenditure category 6.1 or provision of government services, which is under revenue replacement. Any use reporting one or more projects using only this expenditure category will only be asked to provide brief project level data and will not be required to report on individual subrecipients, subawards, or expenditures as part of the April 2022 reporting. Any use will still need to fill out the uh, recipient specific module in the report where you will be asked whether you intend to elect the standard allowance or if you intend to calculate your estimated revenue loss. We'll go over the steps in this option in the forthcoming slide. The alternative option is to report your projects under non-revenue replacement uh, expenditure categories. 
This option may require you to report additional project level data, depending on the expenditure category you're reporting under, as well as information on individual subrecipients, subawards, and or expenditures if applicable. Additional instructions on these requirements will be available in our reporting guidance and in our upcoming project and expenditure report user guide. I also want to note that some of you may have more SLFRF funds than you can claim just under revenue loss, uh, in which case the difference will need to be reported in option two. So with that, let's dive into the process of submitting through option one, which is submitting just under uh, provision of government services. As outlined in the final rule that Kitty just went over, recipients will have the option to make a one-time decision to calculate revenue loss according to the formula outlined uh, in, the, in the final rule or elect a standard allowance of up to 10 million, not to exceed the award allocation um, that, that you may receive. And this is to spend on government services throughout the period of performance. Recipients must make this one-time decision during the April 2022 reporting period. Depending on your answers to the question, is your jurisdiction electing to use the standard allowance of up to $10 million for identifying the revenue loss, you will be asked uh, a series of additional conditional questions. If your allowable maximum for revenue loss, either 10 million if you're electing the standard allowance or your calculated revenue loss is greater than your SLFRF allocation, you can simply complete your, P your project and expenditure report in three easy steps. The first is creating a project or projects aligned to expenditure category 6.1, again, which is provision of government services, uh, which is under revenue replacement. This will include entering your obligations and expenditures associated with this project and entering a brief description. The next step is completing the recipient specific module where you will either elect the standard allowance or calculate your estimated revenue loss. Once you've done those first two steps, you've uh, you'll be able to move on to the final step, which is being able to certify and submit your report. It's that easy. Three quick steps for you to take on, uh, you know, completing the project and expenditure report for April. Now that we've described option one, I'd like to spend a minute on a couple of key concepts that will be applicable across the report and will be especially important if you are pursuing submitting your report under option two or the standard process. The first key concept is expenditure category. As we have discussed, there are a wide range of eligible uses of these funds and Treasury must be able to track how funds are being used by recipients for our oversight purposes. And so we can provide transparency to Congress and the public. As such, we have defined 83 expenditure categories which recipients will use to track funding. The expenditure categories are important not only for tracking projects and expenditures, but also because for certain expenditure categories, you will need to provide additional programmatic data. You will see them referred to regularly throughout the guidance uh, and referred to with uh, the code EC followed by a number. The term expenditure category refers to the detailed level for instance, on your screen, the table on your screen, uh, the first expenditure category on uh, the list is 1.1 COVID-19 vaccination. And that is the expenditure category. The second key concept is a project. While there are 83 expenditure categories, there is still a very broad categorization. Each of them could include many different uh, projects or activities. Recipients are asked to identify projects they may have to break down an expenditure category into more detail. 
A project is defined as a grouping of closely related activities that together are intended to achieve a specific goal or directed towards a common purpose. They can include new or existing services funded in whole or in part by the SLFRF award. Within this broad definition, recipients have flexibility to define their projects in a way that provides the greatest clarity on the work which uh, you will be performing. With that said, some expenditure categories and types of projects require additional reporting. You're required to define projects as sufficient level of granularity to be able to do any programmatic reporting that is required. For each project, you will need to report both on obligations and expenditures. An obligation is an order placed, such as a contract, and similar transactions that require payment. An expenditure is when the services has been rendered or the good has been delivered to an entity and payment is due. In the project and expenditure report, there are a few other areas where specific data needs to be provided. This information helps track results and ensure that funds are spent on eligible uses. If that sounds complicated, trust me, I understand. Hopefully this, graph show, this graphic on your screen shows the relationships more clearly. Each recipient will have expenditures in a number of expenditure categories. For each expenditure category you use funding for, you will have possibly one or more projects. For each project, you will need to track obligations and expenditures, as well as any subawards made. As an NEU, if you elect to report under the standard allowance provided, uh, under a standard allowance and you know, reporting a project under expenditure category 6.1, you do not have to report sub or some award and recipient information as part of the April 2020 reporting, 2022 reporting. We will discuss some awards in more detail in the upcoming slide, and these relationships and the definitions for each will be explained in greater detail in the forthcoming user guide. It is important recipients begin collecting and structuring data in this way. As all SLFRF funding a recipient receives will be broken down and reported by expenditure categories and projects. In this example, the overall expenditure category is COVID-19 vaccination, which falls under the broader category group of public health. With the spending of COVID-19 vaccination, there might be several projects focused on different types of vaccination efforts. Within the vaccination initiative, there might be several subawards to different service providers that would need to be tracked and reported. Now that we better understand the key concepts and overall structure reporting, I'll touch on the three basic categories of information which will be required. First, and we've already discussed it at length, we'll collect information on each project, including a project description. For each project, you will need to, again, report on obligations, expenditures, a quick project status, and again, a brief description. Second, you will report on all subawards, if there are any. Uh, a subaward is an agreement that a prime recipient makes with another entity to perform a portion of the award. In most cases, this will occur when you award a contract or grant over $50,000 using SLFRF funds. As many of you know, subaward reporting is a federal requirement across programs, and this information will be provided to usaspending.gov. Third, for projects in specific expenditure categories, you will need to report additional data uh, relating to uh, those expenditure categories. The guidance includes a list broken out by expenditure category of what those data types are. Looking at just the project level, the, information, the following information will be required in project and expenditure reports for both quarterly 
and annual reporting. I'm not gonna go through the list, but as noted previously, depending on the expenditure category that you're reporting under, the users will be required to enter information relevant to that type of project. Note that some examples of this include capital expenditures for non-infrastructure projects. All of this information will be submitted to Treasury through Treasury's online reporting portal, uh, which uh, you know, is already available, but the actual report form will be made available to, to you all in the coming weeks. In addition, Treasury will post an updated project and expenditure report user guide and other reference materials to assist recipients in entering their information into the reporting system in advance of the April 30th, 2022 deadline. Treasury will also prepare a webinar to go over the system functionality including a screen-by-screen -screen walkthrough of the standard allowance reporting under expenditure category 6.1 uh, once the portal opens uh, for April reporting. Further communications will be shared with recipients and posted on the Treasury website. We encourage you to visit the website uh, often for updates. And again, the link is www.treasury.gov forward slash SLFRP reporting. So that covers our main content here in this webinar. We've covered an overview of the program, uh, gone over the final rule, we've covered some high level pieces of the reporting guidance, and talked about basic reporting requirements and key concepts necessary for you to complete your reporting. I'll close by saying that Treasury is committed to working with NEUs to help digest the final rule and effectively maximize their use of funds. And we encourage recipients to engage their communities in considering how best to deploy the remainder of their funding. Treasury has also released an overview of the final rule, which is a user guide that boils down the rule into an easy to understand summary, include a comprehensive list of projects that recipients can undertake with these funds without doing additional independent analysis. Treasury will, will continue to work with NEUs to navigate any remaining questions they may have about the final rule, as well as their compliance or reporting uh, responsibilities. So this starts right now with a Q&A session, and uh, I'm gonna hand it off back to Namrata to, to guide us through the, the Q&A session.